of you have questions and answers about anything you want to talk about. All right, let's talk about some, I think we left off with the Edinger-Westfall nucleus and what happens and why you get meiosis with um, the administration of an opioid. <coughs> I'm sure those two words are going to come back to haunt you again, Edinger Westfall. So now, imagine you are in, you're in the OR, you're doing a lap coli, or you're doing an ERCP, that's another procedure where you're looking at gallbladder type stuff. You give your fentanyl, you give your morphine, and then the surgeon has to give half a milligram or a milligram of glucagon. There's a reason that that surgeon asked you to do that. Because your opioid caused the spasm of this thing called the sphincter of Odie. And this sphincter, as you can see, is the opening in which two other ducts start throwing stuff into the lumen of the bowel, right? Your pancreas and your bile duct. Because you need the substances that come from those organs to help you digest your food. Your food. But this is a smooth muscle. So if I give, it's an involuntary muscle to help control the opening of that sphincter. It opens when you need it and it closes when you don't, and you don't control it. So this is a smooth muscle. Now, think about activating a mu receptor on a smooth muscle. What type of a G protein is that mu receptor? It's a GI. What do you know that's counterintuitive about activating a GI on smooth muscle? It's going to actually cause a contraction, right? So let's briefly discuss the contractile mechanism of smooth muscle. You get the calcium entry. Calcium binds to tomodulin. And then that complex will bind to myosin like chain kinase, become phosphorylated by ATP, and you get your power strip when the smooth muscle constricts. But if you can phosphorylate that smooth muscle or that minus like kinase early, <coughs> and how would you do that? <coughs> what kind of a G protein would you have to activate? GX. 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 Okay. But now you're activating the GI and you're, slow, you're, you're competing against any stimulatory type of activity. And now the sphincter tightens up. So why do you give glucagon? Like it has its own receptors that activate the GS pathway. Well, what was the connection between opiates and the muscarinic receptor? Mu, mu receptor. Did I say muscarinic? Like this. Yeah, no. So muscarinic receptor acts like, I'm sorry, mu receptor acts like a muscarinic receptor? A muscarinic 2 receptor. Because mm -hmm. muscarinic 2 is GI. Mu receptors are GI. All mu receptors GI? Yes. All mu receptors or mu2? All. All. What I'm next? Mu1, oh. Uh, just think opioid receptors. What do you mean? You said mu receptor. Okay. I was a little confused because I'm like, who's going to say that? No, 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 no. That's what's, so mu is mu. And muscarinic is muscarinic. And you'll see on the cliff notes I wrote you guys, I tried to make that clear. Instead of just saying M1, I put MUSC1 and then MU1 to make that distinction. Because it's very easy to confuse that. Very easy to confuse that. So check out this statement right here. If I give equipotent doses of fentanyl, morphine, Demerol, I don't really care about pentazine. You see that there's percentage increases in pressure. What kind of a question do you think that that sets up for? Ranking. A ranking, right? Fentanyl is going to increase that pressure 99%. Morphine, 53%. And Demerol, 61%. Which of the following opioids is most likely to 
increased sangrelodi spasm. Given that equivocal dose, that that would be your answer. Can I ask a question, sir? Did you, were you interrupted the audience? But glucagon activates the GS pathway, and that's going to create the EPSP. No, in this instance, GS is going to activate adenyl cyclase, increase your concentrations of cyclic AMP, which go on to catalyze and increase the activity of protein kinase A, which then will phosphorylate myosin like two kinase before calcium calmodulin combined to it. So it's just the two kinase in our fight for that. It's right. whatever it is. Well, GI is opposing the effect of GS. So if I get G more GS stimulation versus more GI stimulation, <coughs> then I'm going to relax that state. Right. If I have more GI stimulation versus GS stimulation, then I'm going to tighten that state. Yeah, they run all kinds of nice little catheters up here and squirt dye and look at the contrast to see where the spread goes. And if they can't get in, they'll have you give glucagon usually to relax that duct. One thing just off topic, what's the treatment to help solidify this? Going back to your autonomics, what is the treatment for a beta blocker overdose? Glucagon, because it activates GS. And in the heart, GS will increase cyclic AMP, will increase protein kinase A activity, and then that protein kinase A activity goes on to phosphorylate voltage-gated calcium channels. And you have an alternate mechanism to counteract the effects of the beta blockade. Yeah? Uh, these percentages, is this just for the common bowel duct, or would you say that that's kind of fair for uh, all these uh, drugs working on new receptors? Uh, that is just here. Okay. Just here. Now, don't fall for a stinker of Gotti, like a couple years ago, a student of mine did. Okay. Stinker of Gotti will not be the answer. It's like John Gotti. John Gotti, right? And when we were reviewing the test, she, bur she gave herself away because she burst it out laughing. <laughs> also, why would nitroglycerin work? It's a vaso smooth muscle vasodilator. It works through what pathway? Nope. Nitric oxide. Right. Smooth muscle nitric oxide is a dilator. How would naloxone work to treat this spasm? But what's the problem? It antagonizes your opiate. That's your problem. By the way, I was at the hospital this weekend, and we have a star. <laughs> I was like, I know that guy. Nice picture, by the way. <laughs> it was really an awesome picture. OK, so now that you know or have an idea of how opioids act on smooth muscle, think about all the times you've given an opioid and the patient complains of constipation. Can you see why now the patient could have a spastic colon that stays tight, there's no peristalsis, and all that stuff stays there now? Right, you activate a GI protein, you shut down smooth muscle contraction, you can't have peristalsis. Right? So you can develop colic, you can delay gastric emptying. It's not going to be surprising for someone who comes in and the first thing you see is they're on methadone to treat an opioid addiction. My advice to you is to do a rapid sequence induction. Even though they may have ate 10, 12 hours ago, they may not be able to move things through their gut if they're taking daily doses of methadone. And is constipation something that becomes tolerant over time? And what's the other symptom that doesn't? Meiosis. One of the problems with opioids, if you don't use enough of them, and I, I challenge you to look this up in some research studies, look up giving lower doses of opioids and higher doses of opioids and the effect on nausea and vomiting. If you have, in my experience, if you have an inadequate amount of opioid on board, the patient gets nauseous. They're in pain. They're also not fully stimulating new receptors on these zones. But 
if I can give enough opioid, I treat their pain, and I also activate a larger amount of GI proteins on the chemoreceptor trigger zone. And in the nervous system, what are the three activities that activating a GI protein can do? Decrease calcium influx, plus hyperpolarization, and decrease the activity of adenylocyclase. So if, if I can create enough IPSPs in the chemoreceptor trigger zone, I shouldn't have that nausea feeling, and I shouldn't be able to send a message to the emetic center to hurl. Right? There's two separate centers, the chemoreceptor trigger zone and the floor of the lateral, the lateral portion of the floor of the fourth ventricle, and the emetic zone. This slide is nice. It came out of a 1999 study, I believe, and it gives you the reason why you use certain drugs to treat nausea and vomiting. We're focusing on the opioids, but also look why you give Zofran. Because 5-HT is stimulatory in the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Right? Look at histamine. You can use promethazine, phenergan, if you haven't heard of that. Atropine treats nausea and vomiting, droperidol. So for our purposes, just focus on the opioids, and then you'll get to the other stuff later. Now, if you really want to make someone girl, if you really want to make them hump, give them April morphine. April morphine. Now, you're not going to get any pain relief from it, <laughs> right? But because it is such a dopaminergic agonist, this opioid will activate dopamine receptors. And by doing that, you will see nausea and vomit. As well, uh, one point, what do opioids increase preferentially? Sympathetic tone or parasympathetic tone? And what will parasympathetic tone cause you to do? Where does this vagus nerve go to? The emetic center, right? Okay, now put yourself on the labor deck and think about why you like to do epidurals or spinals more so than why you would like to give intravenous opioids. Think about the concentration in the plasma and the ability the lipophilicity of the opioids and their ability to cross membranes. Now imagine that this lady is laboring and they're expecting her, her to deliver within the hour, but she's in pain. They give 100 mics of fentanyl. That baby comes out. What do you expect that might happen? A blue baby, right? There's nothing like the feeling of a baby that's pink with tone, who becomes blue and flaccid as you're trying to clean them up. That's something you'll never forget. So always be cognizant of the timing that you give your opioid if you have to give it intravenously, especially when someone is pregnant and about to deliver. <clears throat> Why is there not such an issue when you do an epidurally right before you go back for a C-section? Inside. Absorption time is delayed, and baby's coming out in just a few minutes. Your questions? Just to elaborate on that a little bit, if you could. Yeah. So, mom's in there, she's in labor, but we've got you know, prolonged labor delivery. It's not going to be for hours. And she refuses an epidural. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so then that's just the point where we have to know about the drugs themselves, more about the creation of action, their two and a half beta, and still get it, knowing that the baby's yes, he's safe being prepared to administer what to the baby when the baby comes out. Exactly. So you're, you're you're prepping everybody. Hey, 
I just gave some mom some opioid. There's a potential that we could have a depressed infant or fetus or neonate that comes out. We have to be ready to administer some naloxone uh, and have vigorous stimulation of the child when they come out. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody here taking care of a patient that had a tricyclic overdose? Pretty hard to treat. Okay. Everything you give seems to be synergized by that tricyclic overdose. Okay. As well, um, there's an opioid that you can give that can increase or, or increase the probability of a hypertensive emergency. What do you think that might be? It's, it's the Nazis made it. Demerol. Demerol. Right. So it appears that the interaction of Demerol with the tricyclics or the monoamine oxidase inhibitors increases the probability of a hypertensive crisis because Demerol actually has an effect that through some mechanism, either through the inhibition of reuptake or through the increased outflow of sympathetic catecholamines, it increases the concentration of catecholamines at the synapse. And so if you increase the concentration of catecholamines, especially on smooth muscle, you can see where that could set you up for a hypertensive emergency. What other drug do you routinely give that indirectly increases the concentration of catecholamines? Ephedrine. Ephedrine. So the interaction of Demerol with ephedrine or with your mono amine oxidase inhibitors. What other induction agent do you use that increases the outflow of catecholamines? Ketamine. Ketamine. So ketamine, monooxidase, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and ephedrine might show up on a question in regards to the interaction with Demerol. Right. At the end of a case, if you by chance administer physostigmine, it appears that physostigmine will enhance your opioid effect. Why do they, why does Sultan specifically spell out physostigmine? It crosses the blood brain barrier. And in order to have central effects, you have to be able to cross lipid membranes. Any questions on some of the actions? Good. Let's move on to some specific opioids. Now, I tried to pull out the high point of sulfine. It's not going to be word for word. But if you have questions on certain things, um, this is directly coming out of the opioid chapter. All right. Let's start with the devil. Demerol, the parody. What do we know about it? Well, we remember... That one of its bad things is uh, neurotoxicity. Fabiola, why am I worried about neurotoxicity with carrot? And its metabolite is called what? Norma parity. That's right. That's right. Why would parity cause delirium? We're going to take these point by point. What other activity does Demerol have? What does it look like? It has cap activity. Sure, you can get some dysphoria with that, and that's part of it. What's the other part of it? It looks like atropine, acts like atropine. If you remember, those of you that have given Demerol, what happens to heart rate? This goes up. They get a little confused. Right? Do their pupils dilate or do they constrict? They're going to be more in a dilatory state. Right? Because it's the only opioid that is not going to induce meiosis. <clears throat> now you may, in the pack, you see on your orders routinely 12 and a half milligrams of meparidine. You don't have to know about the dose, just the concept. 
giving the parity for shiver. And many of you may be familiar with that. Well, the reason behind that it is it, it may be a weak agonist at alpha 2, and it's thought that some of its shivering effect is due to the activation of the kappa receptor. Okay. The evidence on that is not, it's not, there's not a lot of it, but there are a few studies that suggest those are the two mechanisms. Now let's talk about serotonin syndrome with the parity. Jesse. Why does that seem to make sense? What did I tell you that Demerol does that you have to worry about? It causes the release of catecholamines. But the thing I didn't tell you, it also causes the release of other neurotransmitters, some of those being serotonin. Okay. So what kind of a drug could this interact with that you would be concerned with? SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Don't give me Demerol, because I'm on Zoloft. I might freak out on it. Zoloft works great, by the way. All right, we talked about the interaction with ephedrine and mitriasis. Hey, I'm not afraid to admit it. Did you know that almost 50% of the active duty population is on some sort of antidepressant? In fact, that's part of their combat deployment checklist is to make sure that your soldiers have a 90 day supply, right? If they're on. All right, now let's talk about fentanyl. Fentanyl is probably something you guys have used a lot. Kenneth, what is that thing about pulmonary uptake? <clears throat> Very lipophilic, right? Do you think you can measure concentrations of fentanyl on end expiration? Absolutely, yes. You absolutely can. It will vaporize very easily. So if it's lipophilic and it can vaporize, it can get caught in the air, it can be blown out. So you can have a high quantity of that fentanyl get stuck in the lungs and you can breathe it out. In fact, there is a theory on why anesthesia providers are prone to dependency <laughs> because of yeah. the expiration of opioids. Yes. Yes. That would be a questionable study. I'm not saying it's causation, <laughs> but it has been introduced as a possible contributing factor. <laughs> Who remembers when the Chechenian rebels went into that theater in Russia and killed everybody. Yeah. What did they use? They used carfentanil, which is a fentanyl derivative, and they aerosolized it, pushed it through the ventilation system, and everybody died of respiratory depression. What's that? Yeah, they put them on the buses. That's it. But it wasn't a check, you just get a lot of Oh, the Russians, yeah, the oh, Russians because yeah, they were trying Chechen to. That's right. The movie so the Chechen rebels took over this movie theater. The Russians were trying to infiltrate, right, arrest them, whatever. They pushed in. I believe it was fentanyl. Maybe it was fentanyl. So they aerosolized fentanyl, pushed it through the vents. Everybody breathed it. And uh, I didn't know this, but Brian says that they didn't tell the first responders that they did it, so the first responders had no idea how to treat it, so everybody died. It was great. That's one way to take over a hostile situation, I guess. Now, you administer, you administer one dose, a single dose of fentanyl. Why is it not going to last very long? Where's it going to start going? It's going to start going into tissue, tissues that are not your target site, right? And what does that sound familiar to? The gases, but your induction agents, right? You get propofol, eight minutes later the patient's awake because it's redistributed everywhere else. 
But now imagine I start giving fentanyl for a long period of time. And I start saturating all those tissues. And now I have just everything in the, in the plasma. Now that contact-sensitive hapcon makes a little bit more sense, right? It doesn't have a huge volume of distribution like Sufenta. And so, compared to Sufenta, Sufenta can more easily go into the fat stores and more slowly come out. Where fentanyl will more quickly fill up the fat stores and then will ooze out. And so you see that long effect. You give it for an hour or so, and it's going to take forever for that fentanyl to come off. At least the clinical effects. Why? Because you put it into the fat, and then it's going to seep right back out of the fat. It's going to find its way to the target, and you're still going to have opioid activity. What happens when you put a patient on a cardiopulmonary bypass machine? What is, what is on that CPB machine that the perfusion has? It has a filter on it. So what happens to all your drugs? They get caught in that filter. Right? Your Versed, your fentanyl. So what do you got to keep doing? You got to keep redosing. That's right. <coughs> Does fentanyl have a huge histamine release? No. Absolutely not. Why does fentanyl cause more brain fire than morphine? It is due to its lipophilicity. It can find its way to the automatic tissue more quickly than morphine, as well as it can find its way and depress what system? Sympathetic system. Increasing your parasympathetic outflow much more quickly than the more hydrophilic morphine. Right? Now, fentanyl, when you control for CO2, may be associated with a slight rise in ICP. And I can never figure out why. And I don't think Stolten says there's anything conclusively why it happens. But if you give a large dose of fentanyl, what have we learned previously that it does the skeletal muscle down? It increases it. And so if you increase skeletal muscle tone, what's inside of those beds? Vessels. And where does that blood go when the muscle squeezed? Centrally. And so that could be a mechanism that's the why. So would that be any case? Why is it preferred method? That's what we always do. Direct blood somewhere. What else are you giving them? Exactly. Yeah, so. You're giving them a GABA or agent. That is giving fentanyl purely by itself. Okay. All right. And that brings in the next concept, the opioid benzodiazepine concept. When you start mixing the drugs, what do you lose from the opioid? the hemodynamic stability of the opioid. Right, Todd? Because if, if you're supine, and I give you a ton of opioids, your pressure's fine, but then you stand up, what happens? You pass out. Why did he pass out? What did, he do, what did I depress? Well, the barrel receptor sensitivity, right? Because I decreased all of his sympathetic activity. Now, fentanyl is nice to give um, pre-induction, right? It helps with your heart rate. But if you give it by itself, you may notice a little bit of coughing. I don't know why. And I'm probably not going to test you on that. But it's, if you see it, don't be surprised. Test question or coughing? <laughs> the test question. If you give it and somebody kind of... <coughs> Don't be surprised, but, but I'm not going to ask you that. I just thought I would introduce that. All right, Sufenta. What do we know about it? It's very lipophilic. In fact, I, I think in the chart it's almost twice as lipophilic as fentanyl. So can it also be taken up by the lungs and expire? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Now you may like this drug because it has such a good opioid activity. But in the PACU, it might not be your friend. Why? Because it's gone so fast. And then the PACU nurse is going to be calling you up and saying, I need something for pain. You, didn't, you forgot to write me something for pain. Got it. So what might you do at the end of the case? What's long acting that you could get? Dilaudid or some morphine, right? Sulfine loves to talk about AAG, alpha-1 acid aminoglycosid protein. When does that rear its head? States of stress, sepsis. And so if you've got a septic patient or a very stressed patient, you may not see the effect of the dose that you give to a normal patient. That could be a reason. Supentanol. Are you concerned about renal failure? Maybe not as much as morphine, but there is some extension of activity in a patient with renal failure. And that's pretty much across the board with all of your opioids. The contact sense of half time. Intuitively, it's not going to make sense to you that fentanyl lasts a lot longer than sufenta when you administer it over time. But part of the reason is this has such a high volume of distribution that you would have to run it for a significant amount of time before you saw that slope start to rise because it's being trapped in the fat. Right? It, likes, it has uh, extensive protein binding. And proteins are everywhere. They're in the tissues. They're in the plasma. They're receptors. And so if it finds its way into fat, it's going to find its way into a protein in the fat. It's going to like to stay bound. And so if it oozes out slowly, more slowly than fentanyl, per se, can you see how the effect may not be as great on the patient as it comes out? Because it's going to come out slower. And then you can metabolize it. And then it's going to keep coming out slowly. So you may not see that effect that you would with something like fentanyl as it redistributes back into the plasma. Yeah. Yes, it has extensive protein binding. Right? And I think its PKA is a little bit higher. I'm not for sure. I'd have to go back and look. But that combination of protein binding and PKA is going to keep it trapped inside of places. Right? So sufentyl is more lipophilic. Yes. It is. That and running fentanyl, probably the two most lipophilic opioids you'll use. But then the contact sense of half time is shorter. Is shorter with two fentanyl. Yes. Because it's, it's redistribution so is slower. Uh, it's re redistribution. Yes. On the, on the first pass, I know we talked about fentanyl's first pass effect, pulmonary. Is that a similar? Yes. How, what, I mean, how is it? How is that? first pass effect similar or different to first pass effect in oral medication? Well, this is uh, pulmonary. Right, but I don't know. I guess I don't know. Hepatic is things. when it gets uh, deactivated by the liver. So if I give you a drug and it gets conjugated in the liver, it's a different drug. It gets excreted and it doesn't work at its target. This is not that. It doesn't actually change the molecule. It just traps it in the lung. Okay, so it's, so it's still not... So we can't use that portion of the drug. Right, because it's not in the plasma. You can't get to where you need it. You need it on nerves. Right? Okay, and that's why you can exhale it. That's why it can be measured. Exactly. On exhalation. Okay, thank you. Yep. And if, you should, and if you're interested in uh, total intravenous anesthesia, there's some good research out there that they're putting together these monitors. Um, I don't know if you've heard of set assist, but what it does is it takes the exhale, exhale concentration of propofol and then it adjusts the dosing accordingly. And so that's coming. Eventually, your job is just going to be kind of just pushing a button. So you always got to have an argument of why you need to see it. One thing about uh, sufentanil compared to fentanyl is the onset of respiratory depression and bradycardia. Why do you think that happens, Stacy?
Yeah, like I give you fentanyl and then I give her a soup fentanyl. She stopped breathing before you did. Why? That's right. It's much more lipophilic, right? It can reach the central nervous system much faster. And so you will see significant respiratory depression. And that is the same reason why you will see a more pronounced bradycardia. Because if I can reach the cardiovascular center quicker, I can activate mu receptors there and I can shut down what? The sympathetic nervous system. Increase my parasympathetic output. And because sufentanil is lipophilic, what do we know that opioids do to skeletal muscles? They get tense. And what is probably the most sensical theory of why this happens? If, it, if it's related to its lipophilicity. What does it increase the outflow of? Why do you crave an opioid? Dopamine. dopamine. And what else does dopamine do? It helps you move your skeletal muscles. Right? Who here has seen Awakenings? With Robert De Niro and Robin Williams. If you don't have dopamine, you don't move. Right? What's that? I have to watch the end of that one. So it doesn't promote the release of dopamine? No, it promotes. You crave it because of the dopamine. It increases your dopamine concentrations in your basal ganglia, in your nigrostriatal pathway. So the basal ganglia area is your rewards, and your nigrostriatal area is why you move. Right. So if you put a lot of dopamine on that striatal area, your muscles get triggered to tense up. Okay. All right, Remy Fentanyl. I've used this probably three times in my career. Why do you think that is? They don't give it to you. It's expensive. What do you usually find in your fixes? Fentanyl. It's cheap. Maybe you get lucky and Sue Fentanyl will be there. What's the nice thing about being a student? You'll get to use it. You will get to use it. I want to use Remy Fentanyl today. Airborne. <laughs> Let's use it. Let's use it. I don't wear my wings because I haven't jumped in 20 years, but I am airborne. I'd probably break my legs now. <laughs> now, why does Remy Fentanyl come off so quickly? Red blood cell esterase. Right. It's got those esterases to break it down. you got a lot of red blood cells. you got a lot of red blood cell esterases. And typically, this is going to last about six minutes, no matter how much you give. No matter how much you give, about six minutes is your clinical effect. It's very lipophilic. Now, here's a question. Why can't you give it in the subarachnoid space and in an epidural? A, it doesn't last very long. And B, it has what in it? Preservative? It does. Glycine. Now, I don't know if you know this yet, but glycine, when it's not attached to the NMDA receptor, has its own receptors, glycine receptors. And glycine receptors are one of the major inhibitory receptors in the nervous system. And if I activate your glycine receptors with a lot of glycine, I can actually make you blind. So that's why you don't give it in the neuraxial space. Now, why might there be a problem with giving it um, an academic problem? Because it's being used as a PCA for labor. But what is the theoretical issue with the fetus? Are their red blood cells the same as yours? They're immature. They may not have the esterases. They may not be able to. Uh, Break it down as well as what else is in the Remy Fentanyl? Glycine. Right? And those effects on the fetus are not well established. So, the same issue about giving Remy Fentanyl on the cardiopulmonary bypass is in effect, but I personally, I don't know why you would give it during heart surgery. Because that, that dude's not, or that lady's not going anywhere for a while. Right, so use something that's going to last a little bit longer. And no matter how long we run this, 
It's going to last how long? Six About six minutes. One of my favorite drugs, in fact, I like to take the lauded and mix it into my fentanyl. Robert, why do I like to do that? Okay, so I get a long duration, but I also get what by mixing it with fentanyl? Fast onset. So in 250 of fentanyl, I'll put two milligrams of the lauded and give it a cc at a time. That's me. I don't know what your staff will say when you get to phase two. You may want to ask them if they would like to try that. Um, but make sure you clear that before you just show up and say, I want to mix my drugs. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very, in my experience, a very smooth drug. Smooth by, it doesn't have a lot of nausea and vomiting associated with it. It's very specific to the mu receptors compared to morphine. And in my opinion, it's very underutilized. If you get 0.2 milligrams every five minutes for a total of two milligrams, that's just as effective or more effective for post-op pain, in my experience, than if you give two milligrams of morphine every five minutes for a total of 10 milligrams. I don't, I'm not going to hold you to that, but think about using this drug. You can use this drug as long as it's preservative-free in the neuroaxial space. The problem is, not all the vials are going to be preservative-free. Okay? And this is the derivative of morphine. So that's what I had to say about the law. Very mu-specific. Very long duration. And anywhere between 1 and 2 milligrams of dilaudid is equivalent to 10 milligrams of morphine. Mm -hmm. It depends on who you read. Some, some people will say 1, some literature will say 1.5, some other literature will say 2. I'll say 7 times the potency. I've always learned 1 for 4. And uh, I mean, the point is, is that you're going to get an effect. Whatever that effect is, you'll you'll experience it, and hopefully you'll learn to love the water. And if you've ever received it for pain medication, and you've received morphine for pain medication, then you can appreciate the difference. All right, now let's talk about the agonist antagonist, or sometimes referred to as the partial agonist. Right off the top of your head, what is one thing that you associate with this class of drug? In the concentration of whatever it's acting on. One of the, one of the, what are you experts in? Airway, breathing, and circulation. What do these do to your breathing? They will partially depress. So there's that's the key. There's the ceiling effect. So that's a benefit. You can give a lot of this, and you're not going to see the respiratory depression that you see with your morphine, with your so uh, let's take it in order. Sufenta causes more respiratory depression than fentanyl. Fentanyl causes more respiratory depression than morphine. Morphine causes more respiratory depression than your agonist antagonist. Why did I go in that sequence? Ranking. Lipophilicity. For the opioids. And then the partial agonism is last because it's a partial agonist, which means it's also a partial antagonist. I always love the state all uh, in labor description because it kind of defines how it works. Put you to sleep between a contraction and you'll scream like heck during a contraction. So do remember that. That's about the pain relief you're going to get from. But when might you consider using this clinically? This one's kind of a weird stretch. You'd be like, well, it makes sense because Dr. Bentley asked it. So what, what, what can I use this in place of to reverse? I could use this instead of naloxone at the end of a case. And what is the benefit of using this versus naloxone? You're going to keep most of that pain relief, right?
Now, buprenorphine you may know as, I believe it's Nubang. And buprenorphine, I'm not sure what the trade name is for that. Buprenix, I believe. Buprenix. So what is the point about the agonist antagonist? Two main points. Pain relief is moderate to weak, and it provides a respiratory sealing effect. <coughs> and also don't forget, this, uh, to go back to that one chart, and does it partially activate a mu receptor? Does it activate a kappa receptor? Does it activate a delta receptor? Or does it inhibit those, right? Because you're going to have some agonist activity at one receptor, and depending on the drug, you might have antagonist effect at the other receptor. Okay. Here's another question. Now I'm thinking about it. One of these drugs does have, I believe, some partial agonist activity at the kappa receptor. I brought up kappa receptor and demerol for, for treatment or something. What was that? Shivering. Shivering. So there's potential there that you could use, if you're looking at the kappa receptor theory on shivering, you could use the agonist antagonist that is an agonist at the kappa receptor. Right? And the only antagonist that I want you to worry about is Narcan, because that's what you're going to use. Ben, are you going to push point four? Never, ever, ever. Ever, ever, ever. I will be mad at you if you do that. Because what's the problem if you take away somebody's pain relief right away? They get angry. They get angry. Their sympathetic nervous system goes through the roof. What happens to their vessel hydrostatic pressure? It increases. And if it increases in the pulmonary vessels, where does all that fluid go? Out into the alveolus. And what starts shooting out of your tube? Red foam. Red foam. Pink foam. Yes. Now, I've seen it. I, I have never given more than 80 micrograms of... Well, I've given 120 once. I, I've never given more than 120 micrograms of... What was the term you used? it. Pulmonary edema. Fulminant. F U L M I N A T. So, how, I am going to hold you to this, how are you going to mix up your Narcan if you're going to give it at the end of the case? Because you, as a student, gave way too much of it. One ml of the Narcan right in the vial at 0.4 in 9 cc's of normal saline, and your final concentration per cc is 40 mics. And you push it one cc at a time and look for wait three to five minutes and see if they start breathing. As soon as they hit six to eight breaths a minute, that's it. You stop. Okay. Monica, explain bullet three. I'm going to tell you it's not going to hurt to use it in shock. Can you guess what we're doing here? So the same reason that the Narcan would make you very angry at us. Maybe potentially useful. It's shock, right? So if I can increase sympathetic tone by any means necessary, why not? Are you going to hurt? <laughs> Think about it. If someone comes to you with a GCS of three, is this really going to hurt anything? If all other, if every other measure you've tried is not working, give it a shot, right? Give it a shot. I think I hear what she was saying. Oh, the same reason that it makes you angry. Okay. Is the same reason why it might have a role in shock, right? If I can increase catecholamine outflow, that's only going to help me. But the only reason that it increases catecholamine outflow is because it takes off the new receptor. That's right. But in shock, it doesn't necessarily have the new receptor. <laughs> Uh, you don't know. Right? So you're just saying that the unknown let all things out. Throw, throw the kitchen sink in. And give right. It so, right. You're moving down your algorithm. Nothing else is working. Give it a shot. Because you don't know what this patient is taking. You don't know what's going on. 
did they have a car accident because they were high, right? Did they get stabbed because they were drunk and high, right? Now, there is some evidence that it might help to reverse general anesthesia, but you will never, ever, 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 ever do that. Did I say ever? Okay. One thing I'd like to solidify in your mind is the role of opioids and that concept of MAC. You can take this to the bank. If you give three micrograms per kilogram of fentanyl, you are going to decrease MAC the concentration required right, to keep 50% of the population from moving of inhaled gas to not just stimulus by 50%. So if I give you a question, you have just given a 70 kilogram patient 210 mics of fentanyl. What is your MAC of isoflow? 0.6, 0 0.5 something, 0 0.6, right? That's how you can interpret that. And here are some, um, we're going to focus on the fentanyl, since that's the one that's used the most. But for your learning purposes, you get the same effect with a certain dose of sufentanil. You get the same effect with a certain dose of remifentanil. So what's the point? You're always using opioid in surgery, right? So do you necessarily need to have a high concentration of gas? No. no. And what else are you using in surgery? Five milligrams of Versed will roughly decrease your minimum alveolar concentration of gas by 25, what are you, 26% up there? 26%. If you give one or two milligrams, it's about 5%. So now think about this. You give you get 200 of fentanyl, and you've already got two of Versed on board. Approximately, how much have you decreased your requirement of aging? About 55%. So that's how I'm going to tie in those two questions. Everybody tracking on that? So you said if you get five of the and then you decrease magnetic. So now if I get one, I like, I'm a five and five guy, right? You'll hear that term five and five. What does that mean? Five and five of Versed before we get into the operating room and five of fentanyl before I enter it, right? 250 of fentanyl. When I say five, fentanyl comes in concentrations of 50 mics per ml. So when I say five and five, I'm talking about five milligrams of Versed and 250 mics of fentanyl. How much have I decreased my max? I just got to have a whiff of gas on there, right? I just got to turn that, turn that tin can just a little bit. And one final concept here is neuroaxial opioids. You use them all the time, whether you're doing thoracic surgery, I mean, you might put them in your epidural if you're doing a lower abdominal case. You'll use them to uh, be synergistic with your locals. For OB, you want to decrease your concentration of local anesthetic for analgesia. And here's the important point. If I'm in the, neuro in the neuraxis, who here has taken care of a patient that came from PACU or somewhere that had Durham was? What are you concerned with? Respiratory depression, especially 12, 18 hours out. Okay. Now, I get a neuraxial opioid, and it's going to work in the substantial gelatinosa. It's going to find its way to the dorsal root, the dorsal horn. And whether you give it in an epidural or whether you give it in the subarachnoid space, that's always where you want the effect to be, and that's where it's always cited to be at. But what else is in those areas? Fat, you're an epidural, and vessels. And are these lipophilic substances? So not only are they going to find their way to the dorsal horn, where else are they going to find their way to? The blood. And where does the blood circulate? To the brain. And what slows your ventilation in the brain? Your receptors <coughs> on your respiratory center, right? Anterior. 
Now the third bullet. Who here has heard of the rule of tens when giving drugs? So if I give 10 milligrams of morphine IV, I give one milligram epidural, and I give 0.1 milligram subarachnoid. So when in doubt, if you follow the rules of 10, you'll probably be safe. If I give something like uh, morphine, uh, you, it's not unusual that you could give 10 milligrams of IV as a pre medicine for surgery. But if you want to put it in the epidural space, you would use a tenth of that, one milligram. But if you wanted to put it directly into the subarachnoid space, you might consider a tenth of one milligram or 0.1 milligrams, also known as 100 micrograms. Now, if I give this in the neuraxial space, the epidural space or the subarachnoid space, do I immediately get into the vascular system? And so now the second bullet should make sense. If I'm not in the vascular system, if I get 10 of morphine, IV, that's one thing. But if I only get one milligram of morphine in the epidural space, do you think I'm going to get the same sympathetic money? No, you're not. Yes? I'll give you another example. It's not unusual to give two milligrams of dilaudid uh, IV, right? So uh, when in doubt, if you use the rule of 10, you're only going to give 2.2 in the epidural space, and then 0 0.02 in the subarachnoid space. Now, I will tell you when you look that up, you may see higher doses. But here is the point. When in doubt, the rule of tens is a nice rule to follow. It keeps you safe. It's not really related to the policy. Okay? Because you will learn some contradictions to that rule, i.e. with fentanyl given epidural. Because you can give fentanyl 100 IV, and it's not unusual to give 50 to 100 in the epidural. There's a reason for that. We're, gonna, we're about to see that reason in a couple slides. Uh, the rule of 10, though, is nice for IV versus epidural, I will tell you that. Right? Now, maybe not so much with the subarachnoid space, but definitely for per parental versus epidural. Now, what are some of your problems if you give a neuraxial opioid? You're going to be a William Beaumont every Thursday in the swamp, doing the GE cases, right? Doing the turps, and you're going to use bupicane, maybe put some opioid in it, and these little old men. And why do they stay in the you forever? Because they can't pee. Right? They can't pee. So. Urinary retention is a big problem. <clears throat> if there is a potential that the patient has herpes, you could exacerbate an outbreak with the opioids. Itching, of course, nausea and vomiting, of course. Right? But the, the three to focus on, if I were you, would be nausea and vomiting, would be respiratory depression, uh, four of them. Uh, urinary retention and pruritus, the top four of them. Now, this is a picture out of Valley Review when I went to the course, and I was such a geek that I colored it. And this is going to talk about putting a more hydrophilic opioid into the epidural space or the intrathecal, otherwise known as the subarachnoid space. So if you hear subarachnoid space, the term intrathecal can also be used to define that space. So let's look at the first one. Let's look at morphine injected into this brown area, which is representing the epidural space. Right? So is that morphine? Yeah. 
So morphine in the epidural space, what did I say is in the epidural space? Fat, fat, fat and fat. vessels. Okay. So <coughs> according to the experts, equal amount will distribute into the theca and onto the spinal cord as well as diffuse into the vessels. So when you put it in the epidural, there is a potential for early respiratory depression. Clinically, I don't see that. I see the other thing. Once it gets into the theca, or the subarachnoid space, the CSF, what do you know about the CSF? It slowly circulates, right? Slowly circulating. And this is a hydrophilic substance. So not a lot of it is going to move into the spinal cord right away. It's going to keep circulating. And how often does CSF turn over? Right, so I'm traveling very slowly up that space. So now you can understand why you write those post-op orders, Q2, Q1, Q2 hour respiratory checks times 12 hours, right? Because you're worried about that slow rostral spread of this hydrophilic substance up to the respiratory centers. All right. Now let's look at, oh, and that would be termed late depression of ventilation. Now let's look at fentanyl. What do you know about fentanyl? It's lipophilic. <coughs> it's lipophilic. It's going everywhere, no matter where you inject it. That's the point. It's going everywhere. You put it in the epidural space, it's got equal propensity to go to the vessels versus the uh, nervous tissue. You put it into the subarachnoid space, it's got equal potential to go out of the subarachnoid space into the epidural space into the vessels versus the nervous tissue. And not very much of it is going to be left to be circulated. So you're not going to see late respiratory depression with fentanyl. But you will see early respiratory depression with fentanyl. In fact, you'll find some studies that when you give 50 to 100 mics of fentanyl in the epidural space, that you can achieve equal plasma concentrations over time as giving 100 in the IV. I'd say the rule of 10 would be more appropriate for the hydrophilic or the, yeah, the hydrophilic. Like will morphine be more important than it would normally be as you do here for fentanyl? Fentanyl will be more potent. Fentanyl's potency is its potency. Yes, so compared to morphine, you get faster plasma levels, no matter where you put it. What we want to do here is fine. Right. So you're using, and well, how do you think you're going to use fentanyl in an opioid, in an epidural? Two, two reasons, right? So if you've got an epidural that's got a hot spot, you might inject 100 mics at that time to push a proportion of it to help be synergistic with your local, right, to see if that hot spot goes away. Or you run it in an infusion, and it's constantly in the, being placed into the epidural space. And so you have a constant level. It's not going to stick around very long for you there. Right? So, it's, so you're not, you're not going to get any benefit for long-term use. You don't use fentanyl for post-op pain, but you will use Dilaudid or morphine placed in the epidural or the subarachnoid space for long-term pain relief because it will stay there. Any questions? So why would you use fentanyl as an epidural? Control. Control. So think about it. Why do you mix drugs? To use less of each. Right? If I use, if I put four, mil, four micrograms per ml of fentanyl in my infusion of my epipicane, that allows me to use less epipicane. So that's why you're mixing your drugs. You're understanding that you're going to get 1 plus 1 is equal to 3 now instead of 2. And that is really nice for analgesia, right? If you have an PCA, you're not worried about late respiratory depression, right? You can, they can ambulate. Mm -hmm. 
hot spot is that area. So quick regional, who is with me in the anatomy lab? And we talked about plicas. Oh, yeah. Right? So epidural plica medialis. If you look that up, sometimes there's a band of tissue that forms that doesn't allow penetration of local anesthetics. It's kind of a fold that gets in the way of the penetration of the local anesthetics. But what's more lipophilic than the local anesthetic? Fentanyl. So it'll cross that membrane and may help with your hot spot. Hot spot is an area that's not covered. It hurts. It's it's warm. It's heated. It's chronic pain. It's it's all those things. You know, hurt. You know, I can't explain a hot spot. anybody ever have one? So what does it feel like? I had one with my epidural during labor, and it was one area where I just felt every single contraction. That's a hot spot. <laughs> Take a ten minute break, and then we can have a review for whoever wants to stay or ask questions and answers. Huh? Not today. I don't think it's, I'm not going to introduce a different topic. So you Yep. By the way, I'm still here tomorrow. I'm figuring I'm coming in between 10 and 11. I'll send an email out in the morning. So check your email if you're interested in coming. I'm coming regardless. I just don't know what time specifically yet. So in terms of opioid administration. Yeah.